JCD. You did there. I'll just get it after. Okay, folks. We're going to. Uh, oh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the meeting. We have uh, members of the committee here that uh, have other commitments, so we're working on a tight time, time frame. Call the meeting to order. I want to thank everyone for coming. Declarations of conflict None. of interest. None. Approval of agenda. Move. Move. Second. Thank you. Approval of minutes. Move. Thank you. Uh, business arising in the minutes. None. Thank you. Uh, with the committee's permission, we're going to uh, consolidate items D, E, and F. And we're going to move that to the to the beginning of the agenda. Is everyone okay? Um, really? Yeah. How come? Uh, senior so senior management me. Right? Yeah, I know, but she thought we would. Uh, These are the three reports that have recommendations attached to them. The rest are just updates. So we thought we would do those first. If that's okay, if that's okay with all hands. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to. Uh, we're going to discuss D, E, and F uh, right now. Uh, so as, as Ramona pointed out, these are recommendations that have come from the Mayor's uh, Task Force on Active Transportation. Uh, Ramona, would you like to uh, begin? Sure. So as um, the Chair noted, these are recommendations that are coming directly from the Mayor's AT Task Force to this committee um, to be vetted and decide whether we want to forward with them. So the first recommendation is for um, improved uh, pedestrian crossings, um, the, uh, pedestrian and cyclist crossings on the Confederation Trail at three um, locations. They're looking at Longworth, oh sorry, these So they're looking at Longworth Avenue, Allen Street, and Belvedere Avenue, and it's recommended that the City of Charlottetown install new pedestrian pathways in the middle of these intersections for all users with the green paint and have the decals for cycling on either side of the middle pathway which represents the bike lane. So they're really looking for us to mirror what has been done on the Hillsborough Bridge on Grafton and they're, um, look, they're recommending that this be done at those three locations. I would. I, I, yeah, I think they're good recommendations. Excellent recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so Approval we'll from the committee, moved by Councilor Barrett, second by Councilor uh, McKay. All in favor? Motion carried. Okay. okay. So Probably had some more to that. Well, you know what, Terry, I think you're right. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there a reading? It's just these three. These were the three that they noted, but if the committee would like to add anything to that or expand the level of recommendation, I think it just makes it a lot safer. Okay. A lot of them is pedestrian crossings. Uh, it's really noticeable that green, that green paper. It, it, I think they're focusing did, on the Confederation Trail for this one. Yeah. But what we did on uh, Longworth Avenue, you know, with the lights lit up, I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Could we not parallel that as well? I mean, that's that's the kind. These crosses talking about that they have all the lights and everything they have. They're just looking at adding the paint and yeah. the stenciling on the roadway as like an additional level. Mm -hmm. But like Longworth Avenue and. Federation or um, and Allen Street both have like a pedestrian call light, and there's the rapid back uh, beacon flashing light system at Longworth too. So I like I like the one at Longworth. To be honest with you, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's much more effective. I think it's much more of a visual. Uh, sometimes the 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 over at like uh, the vehicle traffic. Some occasions, you know, it, it, I think you're right. It's too high. In some cases, and they're not. I'm not saying they're not paying attention. They're just they're right up into the crosswalk before they know it. Mm -hmm. And we have people that uh, you know are users of the rails and trails that will proceed to cross the street, thinking that the vehicle traffic is aware, fully aware, that uh, they're crossing the street. And, and in some cases, they're not aware or they're not paying attention. Um, that's not to be critical. I mean. But that just happens, and you know, at, at Allen, on Allen Street, we have a school there. We have a school there, and so and we have people that are uh, 
commuting back and forth on, on the rails and trails, students going to Holland College. I, I think these, these three missiles, not to cut you off, these, these three already have all the systems in place with the light and the pedestrian. I think they just want to paint it green. Yeah, I understand that, but I wanted to emphasize uh, the benchmark that is on Longworth Avenue. And, and maybe at a later date, Ramon, we can, we as a committee, we have a little more time, we can uh, explore that opportunity. I, I, I mean, I've heard good reviews with that, and, and if something's working that effectively, why would we not want to pursue that? Well, I think the only reason I brought up, uh, Ramon, I'm just thinking University Avenue, I'm thinking the Apple flashes are, and it probably be appropriate there, because the bike lanes on both sides. <coughs> Well, anyway. Can I ask a process question? Sure. Can this go directly now to Public Works Operations, or does this need to go to Public Works Committee? Yeah. Well, we'll go to Operations for a report. If I, if I could, Mr. Chair, and then it will go to the, to the, uh, to the committee uh, with the um, costing, uh, and that yeah. comes part of the capital, capital budget process if we want to establish a standing. The one in line with that? Correct. If that's, okay. your, if that's your desire, then that has to go through. Do but you can't, you can't do the one along with that with these other sites. They're, they're already done. So you can't put the infrastructure along with that you on Bellevue Avenue or, or Allen Street now. Because the infrastructure already there. Yeah, it's just painting. It's just painting. Just painting for now. Well, yeah. the, yeah. the other infrastructure is there. What? Sorry, if it's, if it's if I, I thought it was going with the standard, but if it, it's only the paint, then that would just go directly into the staff. Okay. Operational. Mm -hmm. Operational. But as I said, it's something we can uh, we can uh, explore at a later date. I, I think it, I think we should explore it because it's working well there now, and it's much more safer. And you can see the lights. I mean, you can back, be back back about a thousand yards and see those lights, those flashing lights. Okay, we're okay with the first one, uh, Ramona. The second one, please. Okay, so the second recommendation from the task force is to consider the installation of bike lockers in part of the Queen Parkade. Okay. Um, so a lot of cities have these. Essentially, they provide more security for people who are wanting to drive their bike as their commuter vehicle. They can lock it up in the parkade for the day. There's supervision in the building to watch. <coughs> I, I know we have lots of issues with bikes getting stolen in the city. I think that's something that you know they're looking to address some of these this protection. So. so they would be looking for us to add a bike locker in the Queen Park Gate. Which makes sense. So, there, so this is basically a recommendation to direct staff to investigate the feasibility and cost. So that's fine. Um, okay. is, are the Park Gate still supervision? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. They still are? Mm -hmm. okay. Always were. Uh, yeah, but I thought they stopped that and just went to the electronic. Not no. yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So there's someone over Queen's Park Gate all that? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Ramon, uh, the bikes being stolen, I mean, some of these bikes are about $1,000. These are expensive bikes, especially people that, you know, want to commute to work and they want to have that uh, that comfort zone knowing that, you know, their bikes are going to be safe. I mean, big investment on a lot of these bikes. These aren't, these aren't, you know, $200 bikes. They're very expensive. Thank you. Uh, mover? Yeah. yeah. Move? Second? All in favor? Motion carried. Okay, the third one, uh, there's task force on helmet signage. Now this is being initiated by uh, by um, Ken Mernian, Kenny, Kenneth Mernian. I know he's uh, very enthusiastic about uh, helmet signage. Uh, for a moment. Sure, so as you noted, um, Ken Bernahan with the Brain Injury Association, I don't think he's with the association anymore, but definitely helmet advocate, a great community advocate. Um, so he has been looking and working with the task force on increasing the helmet signage. So you're aware we do have helmet signage on the Confederation Trail at a couple locations. We don't currently have it in our road signage. You may have noticed that we had quite a bit of new road sign go up for active transportation for cycling um, this year. So there's more signs for bike lanes and trail this way. Um, we didn't include any um, helmet signage as part of that, uh, but they are recommending us 
to look at the feasibility and cost of increasing signage. Now, I will note that at a certain point, and I'm sure if you've sat on Public Works Committee and heard this before, that you get to the point where you're at a signage saturation point where people just don't see everything because there's so much up. So I think it would need to be carefully thought of, like what are the maybe points of entry to the city to say how much how much are required in this area of a few key locations. I don't know if I would say every bike lane should have that at every spot. Yeah, the problem with that becomes similar to the truck signs where you have certain roads that have signs dealing with delts and you just think you don't need it. So I don't know what the answer is. I mean, there's a lot that you have to wear a helmet when you ride a bike. Well, I don't think there's much enforcement. Well, that means so, the so, outside, so. so anyway, I, I just know that my discussions with Ken, Kenneth Emergent, who chairs the uh, city's disabilities committee, I believe he is the chair, uh, you know, and, and his former role as chair of the uh, Brain Injury Association, he is very determined uh, and like this advance, he's looking for support from our committee uh, to proceed to the Public Works uh, Public Works Department might be operational, Mr. Kelly? Operational, so I I, I support Kenneth. I, I support him. I, I, I know we don't want to become saturated with, with signage throughout the city of Charlottetown, but uh, you know, we're talking about people that uh, well, seriously you know, hurt. Uh, we can support moving ahead. It's the direct staff to investigate the feasibility and the cost. So why don't we support it now? Let's see if we can come back with the recommendations. Okay, move. Have to move that. Okay, move. Move. Second, all in favor. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to the agenda. Uh, beginning of the agenda. Newcomers mural project. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project dates back to the summer. Okay. A very exciting project we did in Council of Chiefs Ward. So it was a partnership project with the Newcomers Association. Okay. So there were about a dozen newcomers to PEI in Canada that had art backgrounds who were used to design and paint a two-sided mural that got installed in Robin Hood Park. And so uh, our involvement in it was we wanted it to be inspired by PEI Flora and Fauna and did workshops and education and used the mural as a way to teach newcomers about plants and animals that they will encounter in PEI and, and learn about. So one side of the mural that you can see there is depicting PEI flora and fauna. Um, Kirsty McCollum in the pink shorts on the right, she's an artist who worked with the Newcomers Association to kind of lead the artist through the activity. So that's one side of it. And then the other side was meant to depict um, cultural diversity in Charlottetown. And so they painted that side as well. So we had a, an unveiling of the mural in August, on August 11th, and it uh, looks really beautiful. I wanted to show pictures in case you're not in that parking, but <coughs> oh, it, does look nice. yeah. it looks really nice. Oh, no, the Ain't over. no graffiti. That was no problem. Some people were like, no, there hasn't been, but yeah. other people had said to protect it with some glass or something because it's so gorgeous. It's a yeah, so that might be an idea. It, is, it does have a treatment over top of it that will enable them oh, to okay. put the graffiti on it. It does detect. Clear probably. Yeah, very beautiful. So I just wanted to share a couple. And of the things. feedback from the actual artists who came from all different countries—it was just such an inclusionary practice for them because they were able to meet other people with similar backgrounds and similar interests. So it really benefited not just the, the park, but the yeah, yeah, to Charlottetown. Yeah, meet some new people. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was really exciting. It was. Jesse did a great job on, on that project. You could see they became friends with each other. Yeah, for us. relationships were built for sure. Good. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you're not in the picture. <laughs> no, I'll leave that to the mayor. Huh? Huh? Leave that to the mayor. Okay. Our second one. Jessica, you're back in the docket. Fall tree planting program. Sure. So we have an assortment of fall tree planting projects happening. So this is just a quick summary. So okay. Monday and Tuesday this week, we got a delivery from a couple of different nurseries of trees and a few shrubs. Yeah. Um, so Councilor Bernard Riverside Trail started today, so that's underway. So along the new active transportation trail there, we're putting in 40 or so new trees and shrubs. 
Um, in addition to that, we're doing a couple of memorial trees in recognition of people that have passed and those people, their family have bought the trees for them. Um, so one's for Victoria Park and one's for King Square. Um, can I just stop you right there? Sure. Is, is that particular program, is that well known to our citizens? Um, they can participate we have a web page dedicated to it on the website. I get a lot of inquiries, but... Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'd like, if, if it's okay, maybe we can do uh, do up a bit of a press release and, and maybe inform our constituents and, and give them the opportunity because they, they're looking for different uh, ideas, a way they they can uh, you know pay tribute to their loved ones. And, and I think planting a tree is an, is an excellent idea, and I think you'd have a lot of participation yeah, from from the community. So maybe we could do something like that, Ramona and Jessica, please. I think it's a great program. Yeah, we'll do, and we'll send that out to all the media as well. Yeah, sure. I, I thank you. Please continue. Sure, and then we're doing some buffer planting along the sports field on Spring Park Road coming yep. up soon uh, that you're aware of, Mr. Chair. Yeah. And we are doing, um, in partnership with Economic Development, a tree planting of cherry trees, and that relates to our partnership with Ashibetsu, Japan. So yeah. we're putting in 14 cherry trees on provincial <coughs> land between Terry Fox and Brain Road. Good. And then the final one actually was just cancelled recently because the corporate group, due to COVID reasons, wanted to cancel and didn't want to go out and do the tree planting anymore. So the one on your report that's on the bottom, Ellis Creek, that one did not happen and will not happen until spring. No and void. No and void. Four, seven. Postponed until spring. No, that'd be five, wouldn't it? That looks great. Okay. That was, uh, that was fine. All right. Nonetheless, no one boy. Not one time, but mine's changed. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Great work. Keep it up. Um, EPC update. Come on. Um, so, as you folks are aware, the energy performance contract, which, which you folks approved, started in April. So Honeywell has been working with their subcontractors and local partners to. Can't hear you. Sorry. Can't hear you. <coughs> I'll speak up. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, as you folks are aware, the energy performance contract, which was given to Honeywell, has uh, started uh, in April. Uh, they have been working with their subcontractors and partners on the island, Colts Associate, uh, to implement these projects, working with the city staff, of course. Uh, so here's a quick update of what has happened so far and what's in the works. Uh, so lighting, lighting has started already. Cody Banks is complete. The only thing left at Cody Banks is the wire mesh to protect the, uh, the uh, protect the equipment uh, lighting in the changing rooms uh, from any sort of damage by users. Uh, that is the only thing left at Cody Pax fire station is done. Uh, some miscellaneous uh, lamps like a sp uh, so track light. Just, just so I can hold there. Who, so who's responsible to put that up? Uh, so Ainsworth is the subcontractor. So they still will put the mesh up to protect the lights in the rest? Yes. Okay. Uh, and and uh, they've ordered the equipment. It's just in transit right now. That's sure. why it's not being put in. Thank you. Uh, um, and with regards to fire station, uh, again, Ainsworth is the main subcontractor implementing it. Uh, and Honeywell has a team member who's local who oversees the project. Uh, so with regards to fire station, uh, everything's done. A few miscellaneous lamps, there are track lights which are left uh, and that's again because of uh, the size not fitting that they weren't able to get those in time so those are left. They're going to come back and finish those. Uh, but the Bay Area, I'll encourage you to pass by the fire station over uh, here in Kent Street uh, at night and see the difference it has made. Uh, I've heard nothing but positive reviews from the fire station uh, since it's done. Bell Light Center, Bell Light Center is done uh, approximately 80%. All the lighting area has been done except for the aquatics area and the rink area. The rink is supposed to be empty next week, so that's why it was a scheduling thing. So they're going to go in next week to do the rinks and then the uh, following week with the aquatics. Uh, of course, it's going to take a few weeks to do the rink because the rink is a bigger area to do. Uh, with, with regards to East Link Center, 
special NHL lighting uh, standards were requested by them and those lightings have been ordered and they are under production. So we do not have a date when they would arrive and when those would be so for where? East, East Link Center. Those fancy lights I showed you a video about a few months ago. That's part of the thing. Exactly. Um, with regards to the rest of the facilities, uh, city-owned facilities, the equipment's there, uh, and they're just waiting for their turn to be implemented. Currently, the Innsworth staff is working at police station to uh, retrofit the fixtures out there. So this was a quick update about lighting. Uh, building envelope work has also started re quite recently. Uh, right now, the, there are two individuals uh, from All Angles Solution. Uh, this was a team brought in from Ontario. They're working at uh, East Link Center where they're making uh, the building as tight as possible to prevent any air loss or heat loss, uh, which in return saves a lot of cooling and heating uh, money. So I would say it's about around 60% of the work at East Link Center is done. Uh, next up, uh, we're gonna, uh, on Monday they're expected to be done. Uh, sorry, on Friday they're expected to be done and on Monday they would most likely come and do City Hall and then uh, other facilities. They're going to go facility by facility. Um, they have all the equipment they need to get this work done. So, um, at Schwack, um, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning units. Uh, uh, so Fire Station, City Works and City Hall have been awarded to Black and McDonald. Uh, currently the PO process is uh, uh, purchase order process is being done by Honeywell in order to get the uh, get this measure started. Uh, with regards to East Link Center on uh, Edgewack, uh, the design has not even started, so that is going to be next year. Um, so West Royalty Community Cent uh, Center, this uh, this center was going through a service upgrade, electrical. Upgrades are out for tender. Uh, the uh, Colts Associate was the uh, consultant which was responsible and uh, for this. And the solar panel ma material is being procured by Sunly. Transformers and power quality. Uh, this these measures have uh, have are still in the design stage. Colts Associates is the main consultant which is working on it as well. Control system uh, is also in design phase, um, and once it, once it is completed, the HVAC systems could remotely be controlled and uh, measured, uh, used more efficiently uh, once implemented. Overall, we are in time uh, to complete for October 2022, which was their deadline to get everything done. Uh, there have been a few minor. Uh, delays uh, uh, with regards to uh, some semiconductors uh, be because of COVID, uh, but uh, we're still on time to meet our uh, deadline. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, the, the hate fact uh, update you gave, um, and maybe it's a question for Peter. Can the planning building be instituted into this contract? So that came in after that council, yeah. so that's not part of this contract. So this this hate back is is, is this uh, uh, your other funding partners in Kansas City doing this? So are other funding partners helping out with this? Is oh, that on, on, at least with the US? Yeah. Um, no. So this for the HVAC part, no. But yeah. for for the total project, we've applied to yeah. SCM to yeah. get some yeah. portion of the money. But the HVAC, no. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Also, if I may add, so the Kent Street was more of an emergency situation, so it had to be dealt with right away. So there, they are way ahead. A, a, a local contract. Oh, that's okay. I thought the main funding partners within this, but I know the rest of the packages. Um, the HVAC, I wasn't sure if it was. It might have been, if we could get that one in there. But anyway, we're on our own. Anyway, so. And and the the new system, which would be put in the Kent Street uh, building, would be integrated with the control system, so we would be able to control it uh, remotely, just like every other facility. Um, thanks, and that. And I, I don't know if this is your question or not. That is there any update on the switch program? Is that new or is that remote? <laughs> sure. Um, is there anything specific you're looking for? Just seeing how the program is going. See how many updates there is. Uh, 
I think I did have some questions. You and I talked about it. Yeah, and I have an answer to you on that. Do we want to put this on the agenda, or can I give it a quick update? No, you, now? no, you can get another time. That's fine. Or even an email. Sure. So, uh, I mean, it's going on well. A lot of in intake from residents. Uh, we're almost in total three municipalities combined. We're about to hit the one million dollar mark that we've uh, almost lent out. Uh, almost every other day, I get an email for a resident trying to implement some sort of measure, including uh, geothermal, solar, uh, heat pump upgrades. Uh, there are success stories out there already. I would I could share a video clip from an individual who was writ, who was the perfect candidate one of her, one of her first persons and their testimonial is up and ready on YouTube I could share that with Ramona to share with you um, with regards to number the Ramona would you like to get into the details yeah just like as of last Friday and we'll get another update on this Friday we had 140 registrants to the program we've got five completed projects, 19 of which are ready to start. So really fast uptake for the program. We're getting lots of calls and interest. And then your note on the greener home. So I did look into that. There's two different auditing levels. Uh, the audit that efficiency BI requires and the audit that the greener homes, the federal program requires. The audit report that you do with the provincial program can be turned into what will work for greener homes, but there is an additional cost. So a provincial level audit costs $99 to do the extra analytics. You have a cost of $149 for a federal level one. And you need that to, to be able to get the federal grant? You do, but they can use your existing report and turn it into the report that they need for that. Like HomeSol can do another level of review on that um, in order to make your energy audit eligible for the reimbursement. The thing is with the reimbursement of the cost, if you pay for an audit, they will do that, but at the end of the project when your upgrades are complete. So you're gonna to have to pay out of pocket for the, um, for the audit. If you haven't had an audit yet, <coughs> request that you have one that fits for greener homes and it'll pay more, $149. But if you've already had one done, you can also reach out to them and say, look, I'm applying for this, the Greener Homes Grant. Can I have you, can you do this extra level of analytics and charge me for it? And you will be reimbursed for that at the end. So, by the feds. If I understand, so we want for home solved, community wide price you did, uh, what we call an audit or uh, home assessment. Home assessment, yeah. yeah. So, that home assessment. Um, that was August 17th, I think he was in. I did get my report back, but it was essentially around the mail first. That was, yes. that was the dot com instead of dot ca. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the, I'm under the understanding that that report also works towards the federal. Uh, it will. They just will need to do a little bit more work. There's another, okay. like the feds require that you run it through this other program software that they use also. That's why you pay. They don't have to come back to the house. Oh, they just okay. have to okay. run those numbers through another software okay. and get a number and a report. That's what they're charging the additional $50 for. Is that an administrative work? Okay. So, so that's kind of something we're working with with Switch. Like, I'm in a similar boat. I had my energy audit done the $99 version, but I want to get Greener Homes Grant, and a lot of people would be in a similar situation. Okay. So, we're, it honestly, it's still in flux between the province and the feds. I'm not Which is why I was surprised to hear when I said so much pickup. I'm kind of wondering because yeah. I, like you, am kind of in a flux right now. Yeah, so there'll be what'll happen is like after your work is like there'll be a bit of a dust settling period at the end as Greener Homes ramps up and gets more clarity. And when that happens, that money would be applied to your cost of your project at the end, as well as um, the, your reimbursement for your energy audit costs. But you may end up paying a few payments without the Greener Home Grant applied to well, that's, that's, before that's, it comes. There's going to be a lag, I guess. I think, so the price, I think most of yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, the million in uptake, what was the max on that? The max is $40,000 or 15% of the assessed the, value. The total, the total. Like, you say we're up oh. to a million dollars? Um, so this is for the three municipalities. Yeah. Um, so it's t about to touch the million dollar mark. 
And what's our max on the yeah. total value I, of agreement? I think if for us it's seven million. Yes, and that's the other what we want. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So we've still got room to go down the road. Perfect. Because I think that would really you know snowball. People are starting to a lot more. I think it would really take off. Good program. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Mr. Jeff. Good work, come on. Keep up the great work. I think it's time you get a race. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Waste watch. Waste week, I'm sorry. Katrina. Yeah. Um, so some of you may remember this one from last year. We did it for the first time in 2020. Waste Reduction Week in Canada. It was a national initiative that many municipalities across the country participate in. It's fueled by the Recycling Council of Ontario. Um, these days, the third week in October, each day of the week is given theme day about waste, and the aim is really just to educate people and help them reduce the waste that they're generating. So <coughs> this year, the themes are circular economy, textile waste, e-waste, plastic waste, food waste, sharing economy, and swap and repair. Um, so our, what we're <coughs> doing is similar to last year, which is mostly virtual, just because of COVID, it still presents a lot of problems, we were hoping to be able to do our fix it fair, which used to be done annually, but I don't think it's the year to start that, it's just a bit too much risk there. Um, so for this year, we'll be lighting up City Hall Blue and Green. Um, we're collaborating with a bunch of community groups. So Happy Ocean, which is a plastic production group in town, I have a meeting with them this afternoon, and working with um, some interns at the province on the food waste component and food council as well. So um, those collaboration will result in some educational pieces, some incentives and challenges um, that will hopefully help people to reduce their waste. We'll also... Uh, Do we... Do we know when um, the City Hall was supposed to be lit up in those colors? Uh, it's at the end of the month, so October 24th is the first day of the week. Yeah. October 24th? Yeah, it's the first day. Okay, because I noticed the lights haven't been working. Oh. At night, it's, I, it's just one blue light on. Uh, Thank you. You might want to get that fixed before that day. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. So. So yeah, and then along the week as well, we'll do a curbside giveaway day. So we did that for the first time last year, which was basically we just advertised and people could put their um, a certain certain types of goods out on the street that stay free and people can come and take them. Um, so really, it's just an advertising piece on our end. It was we got some great feedback on it last year and some people participating. I think um, we'll put a bit bigger push behind it this year just to try and get more people participating. Um, and then just a social media campaign with some educational pieces. And that's sort of bonus of the week. Right on. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we're looking for an update uh, for the season for cosmetic pesticides. Once again, Katrina, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is just sort of our wrap up report that we usually do about the cosmetic pesticide bylaw. So as you all probably know, this um, bylaw is aimed at regulating non domestic pesticides. So uh, those that are registered as commercial or industrial. So basically those that the professional companies are spraying, not those that homeowners can go buy and store themselves. Um, so we have a list of allowable substances as well, but these are the substances that are not on that allowable list. Um, so the way the process works is the commercial pesticide applicators apply to the city for an exception to that bylaw because the um, bylaw restricts all use of the restricted um, substances. So in the case of an infestation, we need to look at that and can approve the use of those so to update you this year, we received 274 applications for an exception to that bylaw. So just for your comparison, uh, last year we received 251. In 2019, we received 256. In 2018, 315. And 2017, 305. So it's been fairly steady across the years, um, a little bit lower the last couple of years than the first starting years. Um, and just also for reference, this year, 273 of the 274 were for change bug infestation, and one was for Dutch Elm disease, uh, which is sort of interesting. Usually, we don't get a large amount, but we usually do get a few applications for white grub, and for whatever reason, there were none this year. Um, and now, also, just know that all applications that were received were approved. Um, and then 
then last year we also noted in some of our analyses that there were those folks that were applying for admission to the bylaw year after year. So to us that indicated that maybe there were underlying issues with the law and its health that maybe could be rectified to um, reduce the need for spraying year after year. So a uh, resource was created to drop out the substances that were had been applying for an exception for three years or more. Um, to educate them on maybe some of those changes that can be made. So that was done again this year. Those households see that resource, um, and the hope is that some of those changes can be over the long term. And just for reference, in 2020, we had 43% of households that were hitting that criteria, the three years or more um, of spraying, and this year we had 40%. So down a little bit from last year, um, and it'll be interesting to see what the trend shows. Um, this is the first year for being here. A lot of years I didn't have to call chip up. I don't know if it's the weather, all the rain we had, or the wet weather makes a big difference for sure. I think we had a lot of applications in August compared to July, yes. where normally July we it gets busy very quickly. It was like a late start because of how rainy it was. No, I can say um, it's probably started two or three years ago. But I think. One of the outlets that supply C was telling her that she could see what over it, and it, which I had done. Uh, so usually the spots for me would change from starters along the hills on the property. Uh, none this year was great. None. Uh, so hopefully it's a combination of both of them. We did a lot of rain too, but uh, 273 of these were for chin spots. So chin spots obviously was around. So yeah. Maybe some of us are done. <laughs> but that was good, you know, that was good acknowledgement for him, you know, like apparently she's done that call. Yeah. Um, anyway, the lawn's green, I think that's what most of us want this to bring on, so it worked out well. So I don't know if that's part of the literature. It is, yeah. It was one of the recommendations okay. that we proposed. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, I did bring up a few months ago, Ramona, uh, I did bring up from the committee the idea that I personally would like to see this responsibility, cosmetic, uh, cosmetic pesticides, I'd like to see this transferred to the provincial government. <coughs> and, and, and Ramona, if you can recall, I, I did uh, ask if you could have a talk with your counterparts within the province to see if there's an appetite for uh, the province to administer uh, cosmetic, cosmetic uh, pesticides, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know they certainly have a lot more resources, and they would have uniformity right across the province, uh, whether it's dealing with municipalities or, or uh, even in the unincorporated areas, when it comes to cosmetic pesticides, and, and uh, there would be consistency across the province as opposed to you know what we're doing here in Geraldton versus Stratford or Cornwall or Summerside or whatever. So. Just for information purposes, maybe you could explore that. Yes, and I've had some of those conversations. They do regulate some components of the, like of the commercial cosmetic pesticides. So wind speed is provincial. If they're spraying at a time where the winds are too high, that would be them. Making sure that they're licensed, that would be them. So they, their feeling is that they're already regulating that industry. It's more that our wish for regulation is more stringent. We want to look at allowable products. We want to have the exception process. They're not willing to take on that level of enforcement for it. They would say that they wouldn't have the capacity to do that level of enforcement. So it kind of is, if we give it back to the province, it would be a less stringent approach to the regulation. Yeah. That's kind of the, the situation for that. All right. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll give it some more thought. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe maybe there might. Be. Yeah, the timing is everything, right? So that could change. Yeah, that could change, and maybe they might want to become more stringent. We might be able to convince them to become more more stringent. Nonetheless, uh, move for adjournment. Move. Vote second. Motion carried. Thank you very much. So, can we confirm meeting time that you would like us to move to um, forward? Eleven thirty. Eleven thirty to. Uh, 11.30, 12.30, Jolie can attend, if you're okay.
I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'll check with And I know. Uh, Twelve for two. Yeah, Councilor Devard, uh, you prefer noon hour meetings? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get away from these four thirty-five o'clock. Wait. Thank you. Can you do something with that call there, Peter? Thank you. Ramona, I'll, I'll give you a call there. I'm just going to come with follow up. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. See you later.